thank you and welcome everybody. I'm Christine Madsen, co-founder of Athenaeum 21. I'm Austin Booth, the Dean of Libraries at NYU. I'm Robert McDonald, uh, Dean of Libraries and Senior Vice Provost for Online Education at the University of Colorado. I'm Aisha Jackson, Director of Academic Technology Applications and Design in the Office of Information Technology at CU Boulder. And I am Megan Hurst, co-founder of Athenaeum 21 Consulting with Christine. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, Christine's going to share a few slides just to set up this conversation. Um, in 2018, uh, we were commissioned, Athenaeum 21 was commissioned by a university to look into why digital strategies succeed and also why they fail. Um, we looked at existing research across higher education, government, and business, and we conducted in-depth interviews with leaders in higher education and technology. Um, we learned a lot in that conversation. Um, for purposes of this conversation, um, it's helpful to have definitions. Our definition of digital strategy is a plan of action for the adoption of institutional processes and practices that transform the organization and culture to effectively and competitively function in an increasingly digital world. And it seems like that world has gotten even <laughs> more increasingly digital um, since uh, March or so. Um, so we will get into that as well. This graphic is really kind of an overview of what we found in that research um, and how, it's, how the research shaped how we frame digital strategy. This graphic uh, summarizes the findings, um, the answers as to why digital strategies succeed or fail are complex, but we identify that both hinge on six key elements and those are described here. So arguably more important than data and technology are leadership, organizational alignment, which interme intermediate between and influence people and culture. People and culture are absolutely essential to successful digital transformation. Um, so for each of these six areas, if you go to the next slide, Christine, um, our envi environmental scan outlines three to six key recommendations for success. Um, importantly, technology and data are only a fraction of the story, as you can see here. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, we found that uh, organizations can become overly focused on technologies in the hope that simply purchasing a technical solution will solve current pain points or magically leapfrog the organization into a seamless digital future. Um, we have seen a number of organizations misidentify their IT plan as their digital strategy. The organizations most successful in managing and managing digital transformation really do address people, culture, leadership, and organizational alignment um, early on and continuously. And um, as I said, we would argue that those are um, as or more important as data and technology. So with this background and model in mind, we wanted to bring together two Athenaeum 21 clients from very different higher education contexts to discuss the different ways they're successfully approaching and managing the complexities at the intersection of library information technology and university information technology. And with that, my colleague Christine will lead our discussion. Thank you, Megan. So this panel has come about because we've all watched and discussed at various times some patterns emerging in the working relationships around technology on university campuses. There's a particular ebb and flow that's happened over the last few decades with responsibilities for IT sort of emerging in pockets across the campus and then being centralized and then decentralized and now becoming centralized in certain ways again. But now you also have an interesting overlap and sometimes joining of responsibilities between IT and libraries. So university IT once regulated to enterprise resource planning systems, desktop support, communications, networking, is now on some campuses developing and scaling services in areas such as cloud computing, research data management, 
online learning, but there are obviously overlaps with libraries in responsibilities, infrastructure, and services across all of these, especially research data and online learning. So this panel discussion is about two different models of collaboration between university IT and libraries that are helping achieve digital transformation in the ways that Megan has just laid out, very organizationally focused ways to achieve digital transformation rather than technology focused or simply technology focused. So our two universities, University of Colorado Boulder, which is a large public university and NYU, a large private university, are two universities that have done unique things by combining or integrating their IT office with their library staff and have done it in two different ways. So over the course of this discussion, they'll explain their collaborative models and how they are working, what they've done and why, and we will discuss some examples. So Austin, let's start with you at NYU. Can you describe your current IT library collaboration and its history and how it came about? Sure, thanks, Christine. So what we have at NYU, um, I would describe the basic model as one in which we have central university IT staff who are actually working in the library. Um, a couple things about NYU to know um, that, uh, help kind of set the context for this is one, we are a global university. So we have whole campuses uh, in Shanghai and in Abu Dhabi and the libraries run the, the New York City libraries run the libraries there and the central IT in New York runs the IT structures in those uh, places. So that the global presence means we're, we're really focused um, in the libraries on digital, right? Digital content, digital services. So the other thing I think that's important to know is that uh, at NYU is very decentralized, right? So the schools really are autonomous, including in uh, the bulk of their IT operations. And the libraries are a school where I'm a dean, it's treat, we're treated as a decanal unit. So we both have our own sort of school IT and we have a relationship with Central University IT. So that, that latter is the relationship I'll talk about briefly. So as I said, we have the model is that we have um, university IT staff in our library. So in two areas, research computing and educational technology. So research computing, we have very close organizational and financial ties to research computing. So these, you can see it right away on org charts and budgets, etc. So we have central IT staff that, so those are staff that are paid by central IT um, and, sh and show up on their side on the budget and personnel um, sheets, but are on an org chart that we're that reports up to the libraries, right? So they these are folks paid by Central IT in research computing who, whose offices are in the library, who work in our org structure, in our departments, um, and are really part of the libraries. Most of those people are in data services. Um, there's also some digital humanities folks that fall into that category, but mostly uh, digital, um, sorry, data services. Also, the Associate Vice President for Research Technology, right, so right under the CIO, reports jointly to, the, to me as the Dean of Libraries and the uh, CIO. So research technology very much uh, is part of the library operation at NYU. Um, we also have a large uh, digital preservation department. Um, that reports jointly to the libraries and research technology in central IT, but is located again within the libraries. So again, for research computing very much uh, is seen as a joint project between the libraries and the CIO's office, but most of the activity takes place in the library. Um, interestingly, I think that's not quite true on the educational technology side. Uh, educational technology side is largely handled by central IT and NYU with a couple of exceptions. So we do have some staff 
uh, that are paid for by the central IT structure that are in the libraries, um, uh, mostly in an operation we call Digital Studio. These are the folks that help faculty um, create uh, videos for their teaching. Um, and, but again, compared to the research technology side, the AVP for educational technology does not jointly report to me reports right up to the CIO. Um, we also do do some, uh, uh, the libraries do do classroom support uh, for um, centrally scheduled classrooms. Again, NYU is very decentralized, so most classrooms belong to the schools. So again, it, it's really very interesting. I mean, we have a very different relationship with research computing than we do with educational uh, technology. The question about how this came about, this structure was at NYU before I got here. I got here about two years ago, but it came out of, I think, um, two things. One is a was a really, really um, strong vision by the previous library director that our library was going to be digital first, right? So that we needed to have um, really, really tight ties with IT. Uh, no matter what those ties looked like organizationally. And the second was the global, right? Again, the global presence, which, which meant that we were going to have increased reliance on digital, really fast-paced innovation, um, and I think um, a lot of attention to culture, right? Because we were having to pay attention to cross-cultural differences, um, that meant that we were paying a lot of attention to culture in general, which meant we were paying a lot of attention to uh, cultural differences uh, between the libraries and central IT. Um, I would say where we're going uh, is to continue that strong relationship, but really try to um, move, uh, move into closer collaboration on the ed tech front. And I'll talk about that a little later. So thanks. Great. Thank you, Austin. Aisha, Robert, do you want to discuss how your current library IT collaborations and how it came about? Sure. Um, I'll start off and, and, and then Aisha will finish up. Um, uh, you know, I think for us, it really started with the relationship with the libraries and our current CIO, Larry Levine. Um, it goes back five or six years before I was in this position. I've been here about two years as well, like, like Austin. And, um, you know, we had a lot of examples of cross uh, collaborative work, some with our dedicated desktop support, which has been in place for all the library faculty staff for, for about three to four years, in addition to managing um, computer lab type setups in a lot of our spaces. OIT has been doing that for five or six years. Um, we've also worked pretty closely with them and our Office of Data Analytics on our current faculty research system, which ties into our institutional repository, which is uh, Sambera based. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, a, a little later. But um, as we were doing all this, what I saw in coming into the position was that we really needed to work much more tighter in collaboration with, with OIT and the work that the libraries were doing. And so my first year here, I started working with Larry on, on what a model might like that might look like. And we call it kind of an embedded model. And it's a model that uh, we're pretty distributed like, like NYU as well, where the colleges you know, often do their own IT. But um, um, OIT had worked closely with our Vice Chancellor for Research as well as our Dean of the Grad School to kind of bring an embedded model <clears throat> to their IT support. So we were looking at it for the library and it's a little more complicated because we have a lot more edge cases uh, with what we're doing and then our own development team, which the other groups did not have when they were working on that. So over the course of that first year, we, we put together an MOU with a, with a lot of the wonderful staff we have to take a look at what the library needs really were. And in the midst of that, that's when we were working with uh, Athenaeum 21 on our new strategic plan. And as part of that, we're doing a major reorg in the libraries. So with that in mind, we, we went to hire a new assistant dean for IT, Jamie Wittenberg, and part of the job description we wrote with OIT and the directors in OIT to take a look at what that bridge position would be so that we, we had someone clearly in the libraries to help manage uh, our stakeholder expectations, but that uh, we could move a lot of our IT team into uh, the OIT area so that we could benefit from their scale 
and redundancy in a lot of ways, um, uh, a lot around the applications we run and uh, how they're run. But, uh, you know, that's, that's like, I would say almost a 10 year kind of build to that piece, but we're, we're really excited about what the new future might, might hold in that. And um, another way, uh, Aish is gonna describe this, that we've been working closely lately has been in our own financial futures process. So why don't you talk about that? Sure, absolutely. So Financial Futures is a campus initiative that developed out of another campus, campus initiative it's called Academic Futures. The goal of Financial Futures is to look at how CU Boulder can increase revenues as well as develop cost savings at scale to ensure the continued success of the campus in supporting its core mission. One of the key opportunities identified was online education. A work stream was developed in financial futures focused on the development of online and executive degree programs. In his role as Dean of Libraries and now Senior Vice Provost of Online Education, Robert served as a work stream sponsor and I served as the work stream lead. As we started to identify possible online programs, we quickly recognized the need to establish strategic enablers. This ultimately led to our putting together all of the groups working on online education in some way on the campus under the umbrella of a consortium that is now called CU Boulder Online. In addition to OIT and the library, the group includes our Center for Teaching and Learning, Continuing Education, and the Office of Academic Innovation. This consortium continues to work on those strategic enablers while also providing strategic direction for online education at CU Boulder. Great, thank you, Aisha, Robert. Um, so back to you, Austin, you mentioned research computing as one of the core, really key points of collaboration. Um, can you give us a little bit of an overview of how that works? Maybe sort of, how, you know, how it functions on the ground? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think the best sort of example of, of the collaboration between the libraries and central IT at NYU is around research data management. So we, and there it's interesting because we have, of course, a third partner, which is the office of the vice provost for research, right? So um, it, the libraries have really managed this process, research data management. We're really seen as the owners of research data management at NYU. So we work, we're, we're, we both own it and we're the, I would say, the connector between the Vice Provost for Research Office and uh, Central IT. So we, uh, we, I would say, are the folks who are focused on service, right? The service uh, side of uh, research data management and um, uh, on, um, external uh, policy questions, which is kind of interesting, I think, right? So the VPR's office really um, shapes the institutional policy around research data management, and we are part of that conversation. Um, but we really, I think, are, are the ones, well, I know, we're the ones that are really um, thinking about uh, public policy around research data management beyond the university. So we're frequently the people who are, will, will draft NYU's response to uh, public policy that's coming out, whether it's coming out from the federal government or from um, you know, funders of various kinds. So um, I think that's kind of an interesting role we play. Then um, we bring, I would say we bring to the VPR the research computing folks from Central IT to talk about and develop solutions to researchers' uh, needs. So there, there we've, we've actually focused on the edge case needs, right? So uh, Robert had mentioned the edge cases. So there we're really focused on things like um, social media, right? We have a center devoted to social media and politics. So we work with their research data, which is really interesting. Most of it comes from Twitter. Um, we have some really interesting cases around uh, films created by indigenous peoples. So again, it's, uh, it's data that um, 
but we treat almost everything as data, right? So these are films, but they raise really interesting questions about ownership and about um, community, uh, community based data. Um, we've also worked a lot with data around Black Lives Matter and um, uh, and um, preservation of data journalism. So we're really, and so I would say what we bring to those conversations is a focus um, on service, a focus on policy, and then, um, you know, we're the ones who have these really close relationships with the faculty whose uh, research projects we're talking about. And um, we also have, what's interesting at NYU is we, we have um, a reproducibility librarian, so somebody who's devoted to thinking about um, scientific uh, reproducibility. Um, so we bring, we bring that uh, expertise as well to the conversation. Um, there, in terms of thinking about structures and um, governance, it's interesting. We decided that, and by we, I mean all three parties, the uh, central IT, the VPR's office, and the libraries, we decided that we would handle research data governance as a separate as separate from other data governance at the university right so there's a complicated data governance structure around like institutional data all that kind of stuff but we decided that we wanted research data management not to follow that same structure but to be a little looser um, and to be handled by a working group that the library convenes um, and then those other groups um, join us um, and we decided that really because we wanted to be uh, pretty nimble. We wanted to respond quickly to changes in the environment. Um, and we wanted to avoid a lot of the mistakes around data governance that all of us have made, right? Uh, like treating data governance as a project, to ignoring sort of existing committees, to ignoring cultural differences, et cetera. Um, and, we're, and we were very interested in um, open data, open scholarship, open science. So that meant that we were kind of coming from a different place than most of the other data governance groups on campus, which were really focused on um, security, honestly. Um, so um, the working group that we have, I think that the, the main things that we focused on in the working group are um, these edge cases, right, because they really test us to test thinking how, how are we going to manage research data um, in these uh, in the tougher situations and then kind of back up from that to the easier ones. So, um, for example, we have a large uh, collection of videos that um, uh, our uh, early development videos um, created by uh, uh, psychologists, um, and these are created by people at institutions all over the world. So um, we, right away, you've got a problem with sort of dealing with IRB and um, at different institutions. That's an interesting question. Then, of course, just the usual privacy questions. Then it's that the videos were created um, uh, to study uh, language skills, but maybe could be used by researchers who are interested in something very different, right? So that's just a quick example. So we're, but that's a really interesting case study to kind of throw at your research data setup. So um, again, so we've been working on these edge cases. Um, and then I think working on, I would say three things, this working group collaboration and socialization, just understanding what, where we're all coming from, um, frankly, uh, consolidating our web support tools, um, and then our infrastructure development. So um, again, I think it's, it's really helped um, that the, I think that the libraries are sort of, again, serving as a lead and a liaison in a liaison function. Um, so we were the ones, for example, to develop a new data repository and publication environment um, that is supported by central IT and that the vice provost for research um, relies on. Um, I think where we're going with that, with research uh, technology specifically is, um, again, uh, really putting even more energy into uh, policy and getting working with our government um, liaisons to uh, really help us um, 
push our uh, advocacy around open science. Um, and then um, working on the secure research data environments. Those are the two things that uh, I think we're working on right now. So thanks. Thank you. Um, so Aisha, Robert, can you give us a similar examples or different examples um, uh, or an overview of how you're handling cloud computing, research data management, research computing as examples of this nexus between libraries and OIT? Sure. Um, I think for us, you know, we, we did it a little bit differently, but we have really close ties with our research computing group that is in OIT within our structure at, at uh, Boulder. And we chartered a, uh, a research center called the Center for Research Data and Digital Scholarship. And it's staffed by librarians, uh, research computing specialists. And uh, because we're chartered under the Vice Chancellor for Research, a lot of their policy people work with us pretty closely on the the data management components and that group you know that's the group that would draft anything we do from a public policy standpoint that would then come up to uh, the CIO myself the vice chancellor for research and the provost and usually we, we all endorse it and put that out there they've been working closely lately with the AAU APLU public access to research data initiative um, and what's so interesting there is we have a good bit of um, research uh, computing infrastructure it's all shared from a um, consortium model, the Rocky Mountain Advanced Computing Consortium. Uh, so we have a, a really um, great uh, uh, research data uh, infrastructure called the Petal Library. And that piece has been integrated with our institutional repository, much like what, what uh, Austin had described. And that's really one of the, the key pieces that we've formed there as a service, both the data management consulting for data management plans, as well as getting people the right connections to our research computing group when they need those resources. That's been real successful um, with a, you know, I would say with one of our research institutes, we have um, uh, many different institutes that are kind of standalone entities that are, that are kind of a unique thing here at Boulder. And the Institute for Cognitive Science has made really good use of that with their large MRI um, facility uh, for both packaging the data and long-term archiving of the data and we're starting to extend that out to some interested parties at our entrance medical campus in Denver who want to be able to archive. Uh, they have a great data utility for live data but they don't really have a consolidated piece for archival data and, and we'll be working with them uh, in the coming year on that. But what's so interesting about it is the, the collaboration has just gotten deeper and deeper. At first it was about the libraries wanting to start a digital scholarship kind of endeavor and the uh, research computing group was wanting to do more with research data management and planning and how to use their uh, pedal library tool for that. And so uh, as we brought it together, uh, there's been some successful NSF grants, as well as a new collaboration with our uh, College of Engineering and Applied Science is called Neuronext, which really will take uh, our data management planning and archiving to the next level because they they have a long-term plan and, and the grant uh, runs quite a long time so they'll get to try this in new ways and uh, that's pretty exciting from a cloud standpoint uh, we've been doing a little bit with google cloud a little bit with uh, amazon from the google cloud standpoint we have a lot of different learning environments where they've been using uh, jupyter hub and google cloud to enable that and uh, th those have been very interesting we're looking at how we can scale that up to be a service for everybody, not just some programs. Uh, and then from the library side, uh, our institutional repository in San Vero was built uh, with uh, Amazon Cloud in mind, so it really runs in a native cloud environment. And that's, that was our first real experiment with it, but what we're seeing there is, that's where we'd like to take eventually all of our applications, and then how do we leverage our embedded setup with OIT so that um, as we do that, we're all learning more and more about you know, what the best uh, version of the cloud is, what the best scale is, and how we can, you know, get the pricing at the, at the right level for us. And I think that's um, uh, kind of the overview I wanted to give. Aisha, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. No, you, you covered it, Robert. Okay. Um, so educational technology or instructional technology is one of the places where Megan and I have seen a lot of overlap, but we've also seen a lot of different um, working models. So we've seen libraries that are entirely responsible for educational technology at the university. We've seen libraries 
or organizations where the libraries aren't involved at all. Um, can you talk about the models for educational or instructional technology at your organizations? And let's start with you, Aisha. Yeah, there's actually not a lot of overlap with educational technology or instructional technology enterprise level support on our campus. Uh, we actually call it academic technology. That's the other thing that you'll see <laughs> that varies from school to school. Um, but ed tech support on the CU Boulder campus is primarily centrally provided by my group, the Office of um, Information Technology's Academic Technology Application and Design Team. We were formed in 2013 to manage the learning tools provided by OIT to the campus, as well as training and consultation on those tools. And we also manage tech evaluation projects to identify technology that will help to meet our campus needs. Um, the library still provides some ed tech support at the course level in the digital humanities and in information literacy instruction. Um, we also, OIT, also works with the library on integrations where library tools are made available in the campus learning management system, which is Canvas. One other thing that I'll mention is um, for strategic initiatives, like we have an open educational resource initiative on our campus, um, the library might lead it, but given the implications on the academic technology space for OERs, um, we have some representation on that initiative. The library is leading it, but OIT takes part in it, given the implications for IT. As part of the campus academic futures efforts, which I described in the previous question, the Center for Teaching and Learning was established. In fact, it actually celebrated its one year anniversary this week. Um, so it's been around for a year now. While OIT will continue to provide ed tech support for the campus um, with, um, given the new CTL it's being established, it will work in co close partnership with um, CTL and the library to continue to promote and provide academic technology related programming all in support of our faculty. Great. And Austin, how, how does this work at NYU? Yeah, so as I um, said earlier, I think uh, we're, you know, we um, probably participate less in the ed tech side than a lot of libraries I know. Um, we do, as I said, we, we are responsible for the equipment and the, um, uh, in, uh, the technology and media equipment in centrally scheduled classrooms. Um, and we do have an operation where we loan out equipment. Um, but in general, I would say we're treated as a school, just like any other school that um, has ed tech needs that are met by central IT. Um, the, the one area that where, uh, there are two areas actually where I think we play a larger role. One is, um, as Aisha just mentioned, around OER and sort of, again, policy questions around um, ownership, around um, uh, questions of intellectual property, uh, questions of fair use, um, um, and, uh, you know, uh, honestly, some advocacy efforts there, right? Um, I think the other area where we really play a large role is um, in ed tech um, and are frequently asked to come in and help um, uh, help lead conversations has to do with, um, um, what I would broadly call culture questions, right? So specifically around um, uh, accommodations and ability questions, right? So um, we were one of the first units on campus to have a, an accessibility and accommodations plan. We have a, 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 a digital accessibility plan. We have an accessibility and accommodations librarian. Um, and we're also um, uh, brought in to talk about um, critical pedagogy. So how do we bring questions around race, gender, ethnicity, sexuality, class, um, and, and the intersections of all of those to the teaching uh, about technology in general and information technology specifically. So while we do do information literacy instruction, it's really grounded, I would say, in um, diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts. Um, and 
so are OER, or Open Educational Resource Conversations. Um, I would say that the other area that I think is really interesting that some libraries and some IT organizations have a role in is um, the production of campus uh, materials like videos um, the, uh, or other kinds of digital um, uh, products. And at, at, at NYU, that organization called NYU TV is actually part of the libraries. So there's an interesting, um, as is NYU Press. So um, I'm not sure whether you would call those, they kind, those kind, that kind of work doesn't really fall easily into education or research. It's sort of that third component of engagement. Um, but it has to do with the creation of materials. So I would say we're heavily involved in that. If I can just jump in, you reminded me, Austin, on our campus, one other collaboration that's happened between OIT and the library and the academic technology space is in the use of our streaming media service, Kaltura. The library, of course, has an abundance of, yeah. of resources. And so um, we've members of my team have worked closely with the library to ensure that um, media is available in Kaltura um, for faculty to access via the LMS. Yeah, great example. Yeah. So this last six months or so has been a bit unusual, um, <laughs> to say the least, <laughs> given the pandemic situation. So how, how have these models around academic technology, instructional technology worked on each of your campuses? Um, should we can continue with you, Aisha? Do you want to talk about how, how things have gone the last few months? Yeah, absolutely. I would say the relationship between the library and OIT has been strengthened and also extended to other groups. For example, we've partnered with the Office of Academic Innovation and Continuing Education to provide support for faculty as the campus moved to remote teaching and learning in March. This included the creation of our roundtable in Microsoft Teams where members of each of our staff, um, the subject matter, matter experts, have come together to provide a virtual space for instructors to ask questions about remote teaching and learning, but also a space for those me's to come in and contribute information. Um, and it's really amazing to see these very, you know, these disparate groups come in together to collaborate to support our faculty in these troubling times. We've also developed web resources um, together again collaboratively to further support instructors. And one group in particular, um, our continuing education group, where members of the library staff and my staff and the CTL would have been providing consultation to the whole campus. Um, continuing Ed has historically just um, consulted for their faculty. They've now moved beyond that to extend consultations to um, the rest of the campus in order to help our instructors prepare to teach remotely. Also, um, partially in response to the move to remote teaching, OIT was able to set up six what we called remote capable classrooms in the library. These classrooms not only allow instructors to record their lectures so that students can access them at a later date, um, but it also allows the instructor to teach students attending both in person um, and also remotely so that um, we can be in compliance with the CDC space rules um, and who should be inhabiting a space. If the library didn't have a good relationship with OIT, we wouldn't have been able, and vice versa, right? We wouldn't have been able to provide these technologies and these spaces in the timeline in which those technologies were provided. It really has been pivotal to the success of the campus moving um, to remote teaching and learning um, so quickly. Yeah, I was going to say that, um, you know, the big piece of the classrooms is, is needing those for the spaces and that's what's in our uh, majority of our main library, Norland Library right now, because we're, we're going to be mostly a closed stacks operation this year in order to continue the digital access we have through Hadi Trust, but also so that we can kind of keep that a closed loop cycle for delivery of content so we can keep that going the whole year, uh, regardless of other things that might happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds, it sounds similar to um, what's happened here. I think, you know, I think for us, there's, uh, you know, we certainly became kind of joined at the hip with um, the um, ed tech uh, 
uh, central, right, in terms of um, uh, helping to um, helping to train faculty on what it means to teach in a digital environment, just because we were more used to that than a lot of them. Um, and but again, I think what I think what, one of the things that's been really interesting about the um, last six months is to, you know, to, it, it's sort of been, I mean, horrible, but it, but at the same time, an interesting way of testing your models to see if they work, right? And and I feel like uh, our models um, at NYU have worked pretty well. Um, I think so. For example, I think that. Um, COVID-19 in some ways has been, you know, a, a, a giant, has produced sort of a giant case study on open science. And so it's been interesting to see how, how our model reacts to that, right? Were we, you know, were we ready to really, um, um, uh, you know, both participate in that experiment, but also analyze it? And I think the answer is yes. So I think the Again, the library's role as sort of a policy leader on campus um, really emerged in the last six months. Um, same thing with digital lending, as Robert just mentioned, right, with Potty Trust. I mean, I think we've always been seen, again, by Central IT as, a, as the people who, um, you know, could, could work with faculty and knew something about copyright, privacy, et cetera, but now, um, so it, it wasn't a big shift to then talk about digital lending, right, and what, what kinds of rights we were talking about in that environment. Um, so again, a good test. I think the other thing that's happened, of course, is, um, uh, you know, a, a, um, a long overdue focus on social justice issues. And again, I think the libraries at NYU are seen as leaders in on talking about having, having difficult conversations. Not that we're um, particularly, um, you know, good at it, but we're um, we've certainly encouraged it and and tried to frame the libraries as a place where these things can be talked about. So in the technology um, arena, I think um, the last six months have really brought. Uh, um, the libraries into close conversations with central IT around digital divides, which exist even at an institution as well resourced as NYU. You know, that does not mean our students necessarily have access to what they needed, they needed in order to participate in um, the, you know, the classes moving online. So I think that's been a really interesting um, result of the last uh, six months. So Austin, you mentioned testing models and in some ways changing models. Um, one of the things that Megan and I have observed over the last few years amongst our clients' organizations is long-term trends in, or sometimes short-term in a sort of a pendulum that swings back and forth between close collaborations and integration and then returning of a siloing of libraries and IT. Um, and oftentimes this just comes from personnel changes or retirements or you get new personalities, new people in and the model changes. So do you all have thoughts on how you create the structures and processes that position the organization for long term sustainability despite these changes, despite personnel and organizational structural changes? How do you keep the, the positive momentum going? Um, Robert, let's, shall we start with you? Oh, sure. Um, I think for us, it's about, you know, we, we've started a lot of our, our um, collaborations with IT with uh, long-term MOUs. And we're doing that with our reorg and embedding process now. But I think eventually, once you get those processes working well, it's about, you know, making that kind of uh, uh, co-reporting line, uh, the right kind of title, and setting it up now that you know when, when there's a new group in, in uh, place around whether it's IT libraries uh, uh, research uh, it's all going to be subject to change to some degree but I think if you can do the best you can while you're building those to make them part of the institution a little bit you have the longevity now that being said it might not be working and or the cost model um, may not be sustainable anymore and you may have to rethink you know what you're doing at some point but overall, 
uh, all of the embedded components that I think IT has tried so far have been cost savings, have enabled uh, colleges and schools to free up what they were spending on IT in some ways to put more toward you know, what their real mission is. And that's always the, the, the issue when it's a very distributed campus because you're, you're spending, like if you look at the entire IT spending for our campus, it's probably more than we should be and it's because of the embedded nature of it. Now, does that mean that some of the edge cases in our institutes, you know, they're gonna need that regardless, right? And it's probably not good to be managing it centrally because it's too much of an edge case. But at the same time, as we've seen from our own, uh, you know, desktop support model that's gone across OIT and most of the colleges and schools, uh, it does work, it does save money, and it does really put that management role, uh, I think, at the right level. Now, is that a, a you know, bespoke model? No. It's a, it's a generic model, but for general business purposes, uh, it does what it needs to do. Austin? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, because I think all of us have been around um, long enough to have seen that pendulum swing um, between centralized computing and decentralized computing. And then, you know, where the libraries is along that pendulum can, can change too. So it's almost a matrix, but I, I mean, but. Uh, I guess um, in terms of thinking about that, that, that those models might shift based on personalities, et cetera, um, you know, what, what the, the question of what, how to, how to sustain forward movement through that, um, I, I would echo some of what Robert just said. I mean, beyond the obvious of, you know, you know mutual respect and open communication and sort of, uh, again, respecting each other's areas of expertise, I think this, what you just mentioned, Robert, about mission, I think is actually really crucial, right? Sort of a realization of our missions and really listening to each other about that um, and figuring out ways, you know, where we can collaborate um, to have the most impact on both of our missions, right? Um, which can be quite, quite different for libraries and central IT structures. Um, I think the question of MOUs is interesting, and I think that might may depend on the culture of the institution or the culture of the personalities, the CIO and the head of libraries, for example, or people in Aisha's position, for example, you know, how formal collaborations are on a particular campus or at a particular institution. MOUs are not common at, at, at NYU. Um, uh, I think it, you know, there's a lot of sort of um, unspoken agreements which have advantages and disadvantages that you can uh, easily guess at. Um, I think again, though, really having some spending time together to talk about mission can can um, be really important as a way to weather those pendulum swings, especially if the pendulum is swinging because of um, financial pressure, right? I mean, I think Robert just alluded to that, right? So you, you know, when it when an institution is under financial pressure, frequently there's a move towards um, uh, uh, centralizing, for example, purchasing or procurement, right? Because it seems like an obvious way to save money or um, centralizing certain service levels um, as a way of saving money. Now, whether that saves you money in the long run or not, that would be a whole nother conversation, <laughs> I think, to have. But, um, but I do think that, um, again, these, uh, you know, understanding each other's mission will help, help sort of whether that, they, just one other um, side note about this, about sort of, um, uh, the models is um, I do think there's um, at least at NYU we've learned a lot from central IT um, that goes beyond this sort of um, very cliched at this point I think notion that that IT is in the back and and libraries are in the front right which is just you know um, you know IT is all about service too and um, you know a lot of people in libraries do what you would call backroom work as well. So that that's sort of an artificial dichotomy. But one thing I think in general that libraries could learn a lot from IT people is project management and project management skills. And I know when we worked right with Megan and Christine, they're nodding, that was something that emerged and we've really been working on that. And that's something that um, 
you know, that's a, a little, it touches on a little bit of culture questions, um, but I think it's, it's really useful for um, libraries to um, start learning about project management again, whether it's, you know, kind of project management light or project management heavy, I think it's an area that we could learn a lot. So we've talked a lot about models and is you might have touched on this a little bit already, but do you think, do the three of you think that there is an ideal collaborative model that optimizes IT support and infrastructure for faculty and students? So is there a, you know, is there a better model bringing library staff into IT or IT staff into the library? Or are there particular variables that inform which is better? Um, or maybe better at particular times. Aisha, do you want to yeah. kick off? Regardless of the model, collaboration is critical towards ensuring alignment because our faculty, staff, and students will be going to each group regardless, right? So we need to know where the best expertise is for each area so that we can connect people to the right resource as seamlessly as possible. Robert? Yeah, I, you know, from my perspective, I think it's all in the context of the institution because I've worked in models where you had IT coming into libraries or li librarians going into IT in some ways. And it, it's really about the decision to want to work together and to collaborate and to, to be able to keep continuing to grow that. Because it doesn't happen right away. Like the two directors of our Center for Research Data and Digital Scholarship told me the other day, the thing they were most excited about is their collaboration is really starting to gel together in new ways. And a lot of that I think is our reorg that's kind of made them function much more like a, a, a regular research center would be because they were still trying to mirror, you know, how would the libraries do this if we weren't a research center kind of a thing. But what I wanted them to get uh, to be able to do is to, to move much more flexibly. They still have to run some services for us and for research computing and for the Rocky Mountain Consortium and stuff. But uh, now I think they're starting to see, you know, there's prime opportunities for the, the services they're bringing to campus and to libraries and IT uh, to go after with grants to help other faculty members and to grow that um, ability. And that's, that's what I was after in kind of setting them free on that. They still are working with everybody on the policy angles for research data at the campus level. And that's probably our next big hurdle is to bring together the right parties to talk about how we want to deal with research data, especially in the light of public access to that, because, you know, that's a big part of our, our mission and it was reaffirmed with our academic futures initiatives over the last three years. So we're really hopeful that that, uh, that group can drive the policy around open access to data in, in new ways. But it's about knowing that context and understanding your campus, I think, because you'll get benefits either way. And it just uh, is the cross collaborative training and the cross um, collaborative skill sets like the project management that Austin was talking about that are going to help everybody. So, yeah. so, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Austin. Well, no, I was just going to agree with that. I think, I think, um, I don't think one model is, you know, particularly better than another, but I do think you know, paying a lot of attention to institutional context is important. And that sounds easy, but it's actually not, right? Um, you know, there's quite a bit of, you know, quite a bit of um, hidden, hidden knowledge that you, you know, you would never see on an org chart or on a, you know, on a uh, budget sheet, you know, about sort of who makes the decisions, right? Um, and I think that, you know, learning that is, is difficult when you come into a new organization and then trying to um, create, create a structure that, again, a decision-making structure that's, that's clear um, to everybody so that um, when something like COVID-19 happens, um, one is ready. And that, that's something that actually we're, this isn't quite a model question, but I mean, one of the features, I would say, of NYU, um, by virtue of it, of the schools being so autonomous, is that there's, um, it's really not a top-down place. Um, it's, it really is not. Um, there are, obviously, there are decisions made by the President, Board of Trustees, etc. But, but um, it, 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 it hasn't been a place where top-down um, decision-making has been the culture. And, um, 
while there are obvious, I mean, you know, that, that's obviously quite wonderful in, in many, many ways. Um, when a crisis hits, that can be difficult, right? So not that the centralized, decentralized lends itself easily to top down and not top down, but that's been an, and that I would say has been an interesting test because all of a sudden, at least in NYU, we had to become top down, even in the libraries, we had to, because we had to make decisions really quickly, right? And so that was really difficult in a place that um, didn't have that culture. People, you know, we, we just had to say to people, right, trust us that we will go back to our other culture <laughs> eventually, right? So it's not quite a model question, but it's a culture question that can be associated with models. I actually have a follow-on question pulling together something that you said earlier, Austin, and you, Robert and Aisha, both touched on a little bit, um, which is that, so Austin, you mentioned a particular working group that was very key to this collaboration, establishing the collaboration and building relationships. And Robert, you'd mentioned your Center for Research Data and Digital Scholarship. And in some ways, those seem to be like third spaces that are neither libraries nor IT. And are, is that a key to successful collaboration, having in some ways sort of neutral territory? Or is that just coincidental? I was gonna say, I, I, think, um, I think that can help because then you're not just on any one person's territory to start with. But um, overall, I, I, I'm not sure if that's, um been um exactly like that or not although i'll tell you the other partnerships are, that are there because there is a, a statistics group as well as uh, applied math group that and some geospatial uh input from geosciences in crdds that's come from uh, service support groups that some of them are embedded in departments and they come to one of the larger help sessions that's now all virtual but it's been great at driving uh users to them and their expertise uh, because, you know, it's all about finding where that expert lives and when they're buried in an apartment or some other, you know, uh, structure that's more like a government document uh, than it is like, uh, uh, you know, an easy user service kind of thing, then that's, that's where that's been, I think, most helpful because all those groups are glad to come to that center and take part in it. If it were just in the library, just in IT, it might not have gotten the same response. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think I think when I'm thinking about our most effective groups, they they actually are groups that have um, people from. They are in these third spaces, right? And there there are spaces that um, also uh, don't just include libraries and IT people, but include faculty, um, which I I think um, whether they're drawn from centers and institutes or departments, right? Just um, those we have a group like that for research computing um, that has. You know, it just has that <laughs> the kind of heavy hitting uh, faculty in the sciences and health sciences on it. Um, and I, I think that's really important. I, I like, and again, the degree of formality working groups committees that kind of is, again, an institutional culture question. But I think, um, I think another important um, part of this has to do with um, sort of sponsorship right that um you know trying to get right the right sponsors even if they're not in the room for some of these third spaces like the vice provost for research or the provost or president i think that can really help um you know make it make it clear that this isn't one a group trying to take over another group or something like that great well thank you very much Robert, Aisha, Austin, for all of your sh insight and sharing your experiences. It's been a really good conversation.